And it is Labor Day weekend, which is, I've always kind of felt was an odd day. It's called Labor Day, and yet we do no labor on it. It's, it's like the oxymoron of holidays. Uh, in lieu of it being Labor Day weekend, though, we're going to talk about stewardship principles for us to live by. Stewardship principles to live by. As we think about stewardship, that's a big fancy uh, you might call it a $20 church word, stewardship. I don't know what you think of when you hear the word stewardship, but the first thing I think of is usually something church-related. So maybe we need to kind of unpack what it means, what stewardship is. Uh, in the Bible, stewardship is another way of talking about how we live our life. In the New Testament books, the word steward is rooted in a Greek word which means the manager of a household. So stewardship has a lot to do with how we're managing things. Has someone ever asked you to watch their kids? Have you ever had the responsibility for managing an office or people on behalf of an employer? Or maybe you have an, a financial advisor overseeing your investments. These are all... Uh, Examples of opportunities to manage things. I think about people who have asked Don and I to come over and watch their kids. First of all, they were brave souls to ask me to come over <laughs> and watch their kids, but there's a, there's a responsibility that goes along with that. You know, we, are, we are to manage things while, not, not the owner in this sense, but in the sense of our life and managing our life and the resources that God gives us, that there is a sense of that. We are to be good managers of what God has put us in charge of until he returns. In general, a steward is to manage something on someone else's behalf, whether they're a family member, a friend, an employer, um, whatever it is, when you're stewarding, you're managing what they have entrusted into your care. If you were a steward during the ancient Greek time, in that culture, you would not be the owner of the household. Instead, you would be the manager of the house and the household affairs for making sure that the home was clean, to managing the finances, and perhaps other servants. You would have managed everything in that household on behalf of the owner of the house. Stewardship in the Bible has to do with understanding that our life is not our own. Your life is on loan to you from God, regardless if you acknowledge this or not. And God calls you to steward everything about your life for his glory and for the good of others. The Bible has a lot to say about stewardship, and the foundation for biblical stewardship is rooted in this. The foundation is that God created everything. God created everything. In the Bible, it begins with the very first verse, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see in this passage that God is the creator of everything. He's created the universe, the planet. He's created you. And that's not one particle, there's not one particle in the entire world that has not been created by him. This is the beginning of biblical stewardship principles. The theme is picked up in the New Testament. You can look in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, where we read that for, for by him all things were created, things that are in heaven, things that are on the earth, all things were created through him and for him. And the foundation for our principles of biblical stewardship is rooted in the fact that God has created everything. So there's four principles we're going to talk about, the foundation of which is that God has created everything. Four principles we're going to build on this foundation as we think about Biblical stewardship and how we are to live by that. The first principle is the principle of ownership. 
The psalmist begins in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The principle of ownership has to do with God not only created everything, but he owns everything. Amen. Everything belongs to the Lord. In the beginning of Genesis, God had created everything. He puts Adam in the garden to work it, to take care of it. It is clear that man was created to work, and that work is the stewardship of all the creation that God has given him. This is the fundamental principle of biblical stewardship. God owns everything. We are simply managers and administrators acting on his behalf. Therefore, stewardship expresses our obedience regarding the administration of everything that God has placed under our control, which is all-encompassing. Stewardship is the commitment of oneself and possessions to God's service, recognizing that we do not have the right to, of control over our property or ourselves. Now, I don't know if we live like that, Everything that we have really is owned by the Lord. Amen. We are stewards of these things. And that puts a totally different perspective on how we manage the stuff that we casually say is ours. It's really not ours. It's His. So now suddenly, I need to think about things differently. It's not my house, it's not my car, it's not my TV, whatever, fill in the blank. Those things belong to God. How are we to manage those things? I would submit to you that there are things that God wants to do and accomplish with the things that are His. And it has a whole lot to do with other people and little to do with me. And I think we will unpack that as we work through these principles of stewardship. But we need to understand that we're just managing things that belong to the king. They're not ours. I, I remember someone saying, you know, they were, they were parked in like a Walmart parking lot. And one of those shopping carts that like has a mind of its own comes racing down through the parking lot, you know, hits the car. And the person was like, well, God, you got a dent in your car. <laughs> now, it's funny to think about it like that, but there's a spiritual truth there. The things that, that we are managing do not belong to us. They are owned by the king. Echoing uh, Deuteronomy 8.17, we might say that my power and the strength of my hands have produced wealth for me. But the very next verse, Deuteronomy 8.18, 8, counsels us to think otherwise. It says, remember the Lord your God, for he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And I don't know if you recall the history of uh, this guy we, we have read about and studied about named Job. He went through some ridiculous things, and then he had these three friends. I say that very tongue-in-cheek because with friends like those... Who needs enemies? But at the end of going back and forth with his friends, his friends telling him that he's sinned and he needs to repent, and he's trying to defend himself, at the end of all that, God shows up. And God is speaking directly to Job. And in Job 41, verse 11, he says this, Who has given to me that I should repay him? That's God speaking. Who has given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. That's what God said to Job. He has created everything. That's the foundation of biblical stewardship. And he owns everything. That's the principle of ownership. The second principle we're going to look at is the principle of responsibility. He calls us to manage what he has created on his behalf. There's an author by the name of William Peel, and he writes, 
Although God gives us all things richly to enjoy, nothing is ours. Nothing really belongs to us. God owns everything. We're responsible for how we treat it and what we do with it. While we complain about our rights here on earth, the Bible constantly asks, what about your responsibilities? Owners have rights. Stewards have responsibilities. We're called as God's stewards to manage that which belongs to God. While God has graciously entrusted us with the care, the development, and enjoyment of everything he owns, as his stewards, we are responsible to manage his holdings well according to his desires and his purposes. So maybe it would require us to take a moment and just ask God, what is it that you want to do with the things that you've entrusted me to be a manager of? They belong to you anyway, God. You created them. You own them. What is it that you want to accomplish with these things that you've allowed me to be the manager of? I think a good example of responsibility is Joseph when he was overseeing Potiphar's house. Joseph, arguably one of the best examples of biblical stewardship, Genesis 39, he was brought to Egypt. The Lord made him a successful man while Joseph was in the house of Potiphar, the Egyptian master. We read, so Joseph found favor in his sight and attended to him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of of all that he had. That's Genesis 39, 4. Joseph didn't own the house. He didn't own the furnishings in the house. He wasn't responsible for generating the income that produced the house and the things in it, but he was given stewardship over the house and everything his master owned. Referring back to our biblical stewardship definition, the manager of a household. We can see how Joseph is a perfect example of what stewardship means and what stewardship looks like. Now take a moment and just ponder, how does your life as a manager, a steward of the things that God owns and has put you in charge of, how does that compare to the example that we have of Joseph in Scripture? How are we doing with that? We live in a culture that constantly lies to us, tells us that we own these things and you know, we can go and have more and we can earn more and we can buy more and they're, they're peddling materialism. And as believers in Christ, we are to live in this world and be a peculiar people. Peculiar, I can pull off. I'm peculiar. But what God means by being peculiar is that we're to do things differently. We're, we're not to live as materialistic Americans in this culture. We are to be managers of what God owns, being good stewards and figuring out what it is that God wants us to do with these things and how he wants to accomplish his purposes and his will with the things that he's allowed us to be managers over. It really is kind of an upside-down way of thinking. And even that is incorrect. Because it's really our way that's upside-down. God set it up. This is the way we're supposed to think. When he put Adam in the garden, this is the way he set it up. You are going to be a steward of all that I own. We're the ones who flipped that. We live in this world, and if we're not careful, we buy the lie that we own these things. And we can do whatever we want to with them because they're just here for my pleasure. And that is not what God is calling us to do. God has set us up as managers over his things, and he's asking us, to do something beautiful with it. So God has created everything. 
He owns everything, and he has delegated the responsibility of managing it to you and I. There's another principle. It's the principle of accountability. A steward is one who manages the possessions of another. We're all stewards of the resources, abilities, and opportunities that God has entrusted to our care. And one day, each one of us will be called to give an account for how we have managed what the master has given us. This might be one of those sections of the Bible we want to tear out and not think about. We're going to give an account before Almighty God for how we have managed His belongings. I don't know that we think about that very much. And how would that thought change the way we behave with the things that we're managing on God's behalf? In Matthew 25, there's a parable about the talents. You can go ahead and turn there. We're going to read it in a little bit, but I'll just tell you quickly about it. A talent, and, and by the way, this parable is probably misunderstood, misrepresented, taken out of context. A talent is not, you know, I can sing and dance. I can play the flute. That's not what we're talking about. A talent to a servant is 15 years wages. Just let that one sink in. In this parable, Jesus is presenting a spiritual truth about the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a landowner. He goes away and he, and he gives three servants some money, basically. To one, he gives 15 years wages, one talent. To another, he gives 30 years wages. That's two talents. And to another, he gives 75 years worth of wages. Have you ever heard the song, Take the Money and Run? No, I'm kidding. Okay, this fella had five talents. Now remember, this is a parable. This is a story that Jesus is telling to convey a spiritual truth. Upon returning, this guy wants to know what his three servants have done as stewards, as managers of the funds that he gave them. The guy that had 75 years worth of wages did something incredible with it and turned it into 150 years worth of wages. He doubled it. Good manager? Absolutely, that was a good manager. The second guy, he had 30 years wages. He turned that into 60 years worth of wages. Good manager? Yeah. Absolutely. The third one took the 15 years wages and buried it. Is he a good manager? The principle here has to do with accountability because the landowner, the guy who gave you the money to manage in the first place, is going to come back again and there's going to be an account given what you have done with the things that you were managing on God's behalf. And this is the truth taught by the parable of talents. God has entrusted authority over the creation to us, and we are not allowed to rule over it as we see fit. We're called to exercise our dominion under the watchful eye of the Creator, managing His creation in accord with the principles that He has established. Like the servants in the parable of talents, we will be called to give an account of how we have administered everything we've been given including our time, our money, our abilities, information, wisdom, relationships, and authority. Now let me just unpack one of those for you. 
Let's talk about money. When we give an account for what we have done with the money that God has entrusted us to manage, have we been taking care of our family? Have we been saving? Have we been giving? And have we used that money to help others around us in need? And that's just one of the things that we're going to be giving an account of when he returns. The spiritual truth in the parable is that the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he tells this story about the talents. There's three stewards, three managers. He goes away, he comes back, and he holds them accountable for what they've done. And that's you and me. We're going to be held accountable. We will give an account to the rightful owner as to how well we manage the things that he entrusted to us. God created everything. That's the foundation. And the principles we've built on that are the principle of ownership. He owns it. The principle of responsibility. We have a responsibility to manage it the way he wants it managed. And now the principle of accountability. He's coming back again, and we're going to have to give an account for how we have managed these things. The last principle is the principle of reward. The principle of reward. In Colossians 3, 23 and 24, Paul writes this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ whom you are serving. The Bible shows us in the parables of the kingdom that faithful stewards who do the master's will with the master's resources can expect to be rewarded incompletely in this life, but fully in the next. Let's go ahead and look at the passage in Matthew chapter 25. Hopefully you've already turned there. Matthew chapter 25. It starts off with the parable of ten virgins. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 1. And if you have the red letter edition, you will quickly notice this is Jesus speaking here. Okay? Jesus is teaching, and he's using these parables, these stories, to convey spiritual truths to his listeners. And here's one of the stories. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take enough oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy, just like you did. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourself. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the wedding feast. And the door was shut. Later the other virgins came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. Here we're examining these principles of stewardship. And as we think about stewardship and these virgins and their oils in this story about the kingdom of heaven, there were five good stewards of their lamps and their oils and five that weren't. They weren't prepared. And they missed out. Because when the judgment came, which is what the end of that story is about, 
five went on into the kingdom of heaven. That's the way the story started. The kingdom of heaven is like five of them got to enjoy that. And five of them missed out. Look at the next parable. He follows this up with the story we were just talking about. Verse 14. For it is just like a man. What is it? The kingdom of heaven. He's still talking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a man about to go on a journey who called his slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Who does that sound like? That sounds like you and I being stewards of the things he has entrusted to us while he is away. To one he gave five, to, uh, to another he gave two, and to one he gave one talent, 15 years wages, each according to their ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received five went and traded them and gained five more. The same manner, the one who had received two talents gained two more. But the one who had received one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and had his master's money. Now I'm just going to pause here. And I want us to think about how we are being stewards, managers of the things that God has given us. If we were one of these, which one would we be? Jesus goes on with his story. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and he settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of of your master. We're talking about the principle of reward. Here we see good steward. We've already given him the thumbs up. This is a good steward. And the reward is he managed some things well. Jesus is going to put him in charge of many things. What a reward. He's going to enter into the kingdom of heaven and be in charge, the manager of many things because he proved himself to be a good steward, a good manager. Look at what happens to the next guy. Also, the one who had received two talents, he came and said, Master, you've entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave, you were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. He gave them talents. The story said, based on their ability. It doesn't matter if you're the guy who got five talents, or you're the guy that got two talents, or even if you're the guy that got one talent. As long as you're being a good steward of what God has put you in charge of. We are to manage his things and manage them well. We are to manage them for him. We're to do our work as unto the Lord, and we're to do with these things what he wants us to do. That's what being a good steward is all about. Stewardship. So as we spend our Labor Day weekend thinking about labor, I would like you to just change your thought ever so slightly and think about stewardship. What does it mean? What does Scripture say? What are we supposed to do as far as being a manager, a steward of the things that God has entrusted for us to manage? What does that look like? How are we supposed to pull that off? As Christians in the 21st century, we need to embrace this larger biblical view of stewardship, which goes beyond church budgets and buildings, though important, it connects everything we do with what God is doing in the world. We need to be faithful stewards of all that God has given us within the opportunities presented through His providence 
to glorify him, serve the common good, and further his kingdom. So as we try to land this whole plane here, we're talking about stewardship. The foundation of it is that God created everything. There's four principles. The principle of ownership. God owns it all. He created it. He owns it. The second one is responsibility. We have a responsibility to manage these things the way he wants us to manage them. The third one is the principle of accountability. He's coming back again. We're going to give an account of how we have managed his things while he was away. And the fourth one is the principle of reward. We're going to be rewarded for how we manage these things. Now, I didn't read the end of that parable. You probably noticed. The last guy didn't get a reward. He comes to his master and says, I know you're a shrewd guy and you get stuff from where you didn't even plant and all this stuff, and I just buried your money. So here's your money. In the story that Jesus was telling, the owner gets angry. Well, you knew I was shrewd, and you knew I would reap where I haven't sown. Why didn't you at least give my money to the bankers so you could have given it back to me with interest? And what does he call him? Lazy, wicked slave. He does not enter the kingdom of heaven because he's a terrible steward. He's coming back, and there is a reward. In the end, stewardship in the Bible, it boils down to these two questions. Who is the Lord of your life? See, we live in a culture that tells us we are the Lord of our life. I made this money. I can spend my money on whatever I want. You know, there's a whole lot of eyes in that paragraph. That's what culture says. That's what the world says. Not what Scripture says. If I'm the Lord of my life, I'm serving me, and I'm not serving him, I'm not being a good steward of his things, and there is no reward. The first question is, who's the Lord of your life? It leads to this follow-up question. Are you or is the Lord? Are you the Lord of your life? Or is He the Lord of your life and you're recognizing we don't own any of this. We're managers on His behalf. Let's pray together.